is your relationship with time? Are you wired and tired, stressed and overwhelmed, busy and going nowhere, or just want to scale your business? Welcome to Take Back Time with your host, Penny Zanker. Penny focuses on books, strategies, tools, and tips to help you work smarter and approach your time more strategically. As a result, you can have more energy, focus, and get more done in less time. Be more efficient and effective. Get ready to take back time. Hello and welcome to Take Back Time. My name is Penny Zanker and I'm your host. And I'm excited today to talk about psychology and mental health in the workplace. It's a big topic right now and we are going to cover it with Dr. Marie Ellen Peltier. I've said it. <laughs> yes. And she is an award-winning leadership and workplace mental health expert, psychologist, advisor, and speaker. And as one of the only or just a handful of work psychologists holding both a PhD and an MBA, gives her both that balance, right? She brings a mix of business and clinical expertise to her talk and to her work. And she's led mental health strategy in senior leadership positions for organizations such as Sun Life Financial, a global 500 company. And she's also been on the boards of Canadian Psychological Association and the International Association of Applied Psychology. And she is an active member of the Global Clinical Practice Network of the World Health Organization. And she's going to show us that she possesses a unique ability to translate psychology research about health performance and resiliency into strategies that professionals, leaders, and teams need to thrive. Yes, we need to talk about this today. This is so important. Welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, Penny. Jeez, I don't even know where to start. First of all, what makes you interested in both psychology and the workplace? Like what brings that unique blend together for you? I got there by, you know, how early career sometimes evolves, right? It brings you in different roles. In my case, a couple of decades ago, being able to be a psychologist in the context of workplace in employee and, and family assistance programs, for example, was such a an opportunity for me to see how sometimes a very little bit of information could make a huge difference in the outcome, in how people feel, think, and the choices they make. And so that's how that started. And then things evolved from there. When I continued my research, I did the uh, research in telehealth about 20 years ago. Now it's very mainstream, of course, but at the time it wasn't, yeah. which was also to decrease the challenges with access that people had. But in order to do that research, I needed to do a lot of management of money, funding, and people, which then lead, led to my business training. And so at the end of all this, ended up doing management in workplace mental health, so being a leader myself in these types of situations. And things evolved from there, from insurance carriers, other employee and family assistance programs, public, private sector. And then now having my own business where I do the speaking, I'm a retainer with individuals and organizations to support their resilience and workplace mental health and still work also a little bit as a psychologist. Fantastic. Sounds like you've got a lot going on. <laughs> and all things I love, really. So it's good which is good. So yeah, so this is so important to talk about today. They're talking about that engagement has slipped years ago. Gallup had said we were only 30% engaged. And now the most recent figures are we're only 18%. And what your take on, and then of course, burnout is at an all-time high. So I'd like your take on what is the cause and what needs to change? I know that's a lot of questions in one, but let's start with What's going on really from your perspective? The burnout rates were fairly high even before the pandemic. And we know that not just burnout, but impact on our overall psychological health and resilience have been there because of the pandemic. For example, a recent, that's Canadian data, but we know it's aligned with what other countries are seeing. There has been an increase of 75% in mental health disability claims from pre-pandemic. So just illustrated, illustrating that there has been an impact of pandemic and there were also challenges pre-pandemic. So in terms of what is the cause, there is probably a multitude of causes. But for example, if we look at where we're at now, certainly even if for some people going through the past couple of years have been okay, it's not been extremely challenging. For some people, it has been extremely challenging, but for everyone, it has had an impact. And that's the one piece to keep in mind, not in a making it a terrible thing way, but in acknowledging it 
Because if we acknowledge it, then it's better for us. We may take better actions. And then it's better also for us as members of teams, leaders of teams, so that we can be a bit more compassionate, not only for ourselves, which we need to, and others as well. So so let me stop you for a second there. Let me just jump in because I want to make sure people who are listening, especially those leaders that are out there, this is not new to the pandemic, right? And you're on the board of the World Health Organization, right? They declared stress a worldwide epidemic before the pandemic. So I do think that what you said there was really important is that we check in and understand that things have amplified and that there's, like you said, everybody's impacted, but that we had a problem before. Something is broken and it's probably partially the management aspect of things. And it feels like we haven't gotten it right yet. So many of these variables in the overall equation of, say, psychological health and resilience, they are in flux. They change. So, right, you may be at a moment in time with a certain type of leader, but given your context and other demands in your life, things work out perfectly fine at that moment in time. You would have this similar experience at a different moment in time, with whether for, from what they bring, from what you bring, and mm-hmm. for all kinds of reasons, it doesn't work as well. And I think that the direction that there is one part of this direction that is actually helping is that we are talking more about it. And not just in the, oh, let's talk more about mental health, decrease the stigma. It's still true. The stigma is less than what it was. It's still a bit there. So we need to continue to work on it. But the level of conversation was already higher pre-pandemic than, say, five years ago. And even now, it is higher as well. And what comes with conversation, it's, yes, in part, the stigma. But of course, it's the literacy, the understanding of what's going on when, say, someone has challenges in the workplace, what happens when someone goes through a burnout. And an episode of burnout, for example, we often describe it as a relationship between us, the employee and the employer or the employment situation, a breakup in that relationship. And so just like in relationships, there are things we can do proactively that are likely to protect us. And the more we have literacy, information, everyone has information, we are going to be better as collaborators and contributors and as leaders. And then our overall leaders will also be better and overall will move in a better direction. Absolutely. We're having that discussion and that's making it more discussion, making us more aware when we recognize the symptoms and being able to proactively engage with that. That's good. That's an important shift. So how does this mental health, the big term right now that everybody's talking about is this quiet quitting. Is that a mental health issue in terms of that people are shutting down or is it a positive mental health thing where they're actually setting boundaries for themselves and caring for their wellness. What do you see that? I know it's a term that has grabbed attention, I think is a way to continue the conversation in itself. Quite quitting is not something that's new. Many people before have decided to rethink how they want to approach their work. It's a word that has allowed more conversation now. But in terms of if we assume that quiet quitting refers to looking at how you've been handling work, and let's say you've been giving it all you got, all the minutes of all your days and night. And that now refers to deciding what part of my life do I want to put in work and what part of my life is not work, personal life, time with family and friends, exercise, whatever it is, then that may be a just healthy boundaries. Absolutely. It, it depends, right? That's what I hear. And, and I don't know about you, but like you talked about literacy, right? It's important that we have language and that we can discuss it. But at the same time, I feel like that's a harmful label. And I feel like sometimes we create these labels and then we bucket everybody in and and handle them as quiet quitters versus these people are setting balance for themselves. And these people are really fed up with being treated unfairly. So how do you suggest that leaders deal with that in the sense of mental health and really addressing where there are positive aspects of it and not so great aspects? Yeah, I think I would let go of the label, actually. (laughs) I would not use it. Instead, I would just try to learn from each person's experience and what is going on for you. Because you could have someone that labels themselves or has been labeled by others as a quiet quitter. And it may be someone that who is disengaged, that does not find whatever meaning they used to find, or they're ready for their next role, whether it's a different role or a lateral role, whatever. They're ready for the next challenge. That could be that. It could also be someone that used to do things differently, and now their personal context has changed such that they need to revisit 
how they just how they use their time and where they put their energy and how. And it may be fabulous for everyone, including the employer, that this individual is deciding to do things a bit differently. So it could be healthier, like good. Right. Supporting them in the long range, supporting the organization in the long range. So I would go instead with just what's what's your experience? How are you feeling, thinking? What are your needs? And then we can go from there and have a more specific, more honest, more compassionate conversation because now we understand what this really means for this individual. Absolutely. So keep it individualized and let's stay away from those labels. And plus, it's not an official label anyway. It's not a diagnostic. It's not... Right. <laughs> It's just a term. Be, right? They're throwing it around like it is a diagnostic. So that's why I wanted to bring that up because I think exactly. it's problematic. Yeah. But you know, what? I think it's true for so many other people, so many experiences. Say someone could be going through, let's say, a depression. We would not want as, say, an employer or a leader of a team, if someone comes forward and says, I was off for a period of time and they're choosing to tell us why they were off and that kind of thing. I would still not go with oh, okay, this is the label and therefore everyone who's gone through this experience needs it. No, because their context will be different. And so you still want to go with, okay, so given this, what does that mean for you? Do you need anything from us at this point or you're okay and you'll just let us know? It depends. Have you seen leaders struggling because there's probably a lot more individual attention that is needed? Do do you find them being overwhelmed because they don't have the time to, to connect with so many individuals? Is that something that you're seeing? I'm sometimes overwhelmed, sometimes also just fatigued, actually. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they have made the time, especially earlier in the pandemic, but we're still feeling now the tail end of it. Because at some point, especially during the pandemic, there was this strong encouragement to leaders, especially because they were connecting many of them more from a distance, to check in even more, more than ever. And Mm -hmm. people were feeling a bit, it was... Sometimes happening that people were happier than before, but a lot of the time they were the same or having some challenges. And therefore, for some leaders, it has actually led to compassion fatigue, a term that we used to use mostly for professions that were very focused on needing to listen to others, like healthcare and education. Right. But now it's every every leader that has suddenly spent way more time asking the question, receiving Wait creates a load. There's been some of that as well, which then leads to also us as leaders looking at, okay, given the new context, there used to be a way in which I was operating as a leader and it was working fine for me. And now the context is different. What do I need here to continue to be that fabulous, inspiring leader to my team? So what is it that you're finding and recommending for these leaders during this next, the future of work, right? For this next coming year of 2023, what to expect? What are some top tips? Yeah, I think the one of the things I said early in the pandemic, it was not so well received then. Now it's a bit better. But it's as if people did not assume that things like this could happen. And of course they can. And they probably will just in different shapes and forms. So the more we can now strategically plan our resilience, the better. Because resilience is not a given. Even if leaders and highly performing professionals, sometimes we're told, oh, you're so resilient. And they've seen themselves go through so much. They most get to a point where they think it's a personality trait. It's in them. It's going to be there for them whenever they need it. And that's it. The reality is that we need to nourish it. And that's the key aspect. The thing that for some of the people I work with is literally the game changer. That's also the topic of my book. (laughs) But the idea that you need to be strategic about your resilience. Therefore, The same way you've been strategic about other things in your work, when you've launched a product, when you've launched a new service, when you've built a company, you've had to look at what were the supplies and demands? What were the elements of the context? What was the mission of your company? In this case, what are your values? And given all this and given, say, an objective of front loading on your resilience, given that we need to still build back to where we were and then ideally front load for whatever's going to come next, the additional demands. Then we want to, for each of us, look at what does that mean for me? Where are my opportunities? Where are my gaps? Because often leaders will, yeah, assume that it's in them so they won't do anything about it. They'll also minimize their need to pay attention, thinking they need to support others instead. You still need to support others, but you also need to support yourself so that you can continue to be fabulous 
Right. right. Any parents knows, right? If you're getting up constantly for your child, right, that's crying at night or something like that. And then when you're depleted, you're a little bit more irritable. You're not as, as so it's taking care of yourself, right? The sleep, exercise, the mental well-being, and all of those things, definitely. It is all those, of those things, but I'll tell you, the challenge is not for the people I work with don't have the challenge of not knowing this. They know this. Sure. We, now we've, everyone's heard this so much. Sure. So They're just not, not doing what they know. That's right. It's how to implement it because the level of demands that they're facing is such that external things will come on a regular all day, all night, never ending. And so how do you then protect the time to do these things? How will you select moments where you're going to maintain a boundary to protect this time for you while there was an external demand that you wish you could have just said yes to. And so that's when having that strategy, the same way for a business, right? You could be tempted to say yes to all of these requests, but if you've made your business plan and your strategic plan, you know which ones you're going to say no to and you know why. So, so that's what a resilience plan looks like. That sounds interesting. Pick maybe a person that you work with, call him Fred or whatever. Let's hear what Because I really like what you said, and I talk about this a lot too, is that we have to protect our time and protect those things that are most important and plan for them and make sure that they are scheduled or that there is space for what is most important. So how does one do that when it comes to resilience? That's right. And it's going to be, again, similar to what we do on the business front, building a plan that's going to work for right now that may need to evolve over time. So specifically, I was giving a keynote and a workshop for an organization a few weeks ago. International, I had their leaders internationally all in one room. And that's what they were doing, building their personal strategic resilience plan. And we walked through those various pieces of conversations, including what are your values? And at which point, we then create a plan the same way we would for any strategic plan. Which pillars are you going to focus on and which type of actions are you going to have? So for this individual, one of his values was health. And as therefore, he actually chose one of his strategic pillars to be to take care of his physical health specifically even more. Mm-hmm. So then he was looking at specific actions. For him, he realized, because we always look for actions that are very realistically doable. We don't want someone who's not been exercising to say, I'm going to go to the gym five times a week. It's not going to happen. For him, he was over 50 and realized he had not seen a physician for the past six years. No check-in, no nothing. That was one of his actions. See, it's when you take the time to look at your particular context, tying all of this together, that leads to creating a plan that it's not creating something that it looks nice on paper, but you'll never do. It's very specific to what you have right now. And people do walk out of these conversations knowing exactly that his next action was clear. Book an appointment with my physician. See, so that's the idea. It's bringing together the whole strategic planning here with everything we know about resilience and psychology to make it very personal to you today kind of thing. Fantastic. I just wanted people to hear like a specific example so that they understand that it's also a process that they know, right? You take what your goal is and then you identify short-term, long-term goals and the actions that go under those goals. It's not complicated. And like you said, it's, The most important thing is that you pick things that are simple and actionable and you just make it so that you're actually taking action and not just making a plan. How many people make a plan and then never follow the plan? That's right. It's always that question, right? But what's most important, a really good strategy or just execution? And we really want both. We want a good strategy, well executed. And part of what does that is making sure that it is actionable and doable. And I've actually had one person come to that same workshop twice for she was part of two different groups and it just happened that way and but she was reflecting on how five months later so she had done her plan Mm. over here perfect for for her it was january and i'll add her actions so when she showed up here she actually brought herself to do the exercise again and realized her plan was completely different because she did take these actions it was for the next thing for her it's very much something that's alive and that will evolve over time fantastic So what else do you think is important for the listeners to know before we get into a wrap up? What did I miss? What didn't I ask you that you think is really important for them to know? There's a number of, when you start going into the details of this, and that's where the challenges sometimes will reside. For example, people will usually agree with the logic of this. It becomes a challenge is when their own beliefs get in the way. For example, they may have a belief that 
they need to be there for others more than taking care of themselves. And so that will get in the way of taking actions. Or sometimes they will believe that they can override what their brain needs. For example, they'll say, if I actually put a few almost all nighters a few times this week, yeah. I'll be able to get on top of things and I'll be, I'll feel good. I will feel like I have control. This is part of what I want. That's one of, of my values. I've got so, that little voice in my head too that says that it's always wrong. <laughs> and that's the complexity because when you work on having all of your values, you're going to be able to see sometimes the conflicts between them. So see the conflict between I want to take care of my health and invest in my resilience, which means, no, I should not put an all-nighter. I should stop working at nine so I can go to bed at 10 so I can sleep seven to eight hours. And then you're going to have this value of getting things done and being on top of all my demands. And it does require, if we just... How do you break through that? That's a great example because I think probably 35% of the people, if not more, have that specific challenge. So how do you break through that? Yeah. So for each person, it's going to differ. But one person I worked with, for example, had to then step back and look at the details of, okay, am I able to do, say, one night that I will sleep six hours? I'm going to use that. It will be a one time. And I'm not going to try to do everything I have to do. I'm going to focus on the two things that really have to be done at this moment in time, knowing I'm not going to be on top of everything. So that you, it's almost like flexing on a bit of both. But it's often like this. When values don't go in the same direction, it usually is not the best idea to just pick one and run with it. Oh, I will just sleep and not do the work, or I will just do the work and not sleep. It's finding the flexibility between the two and being creative. And in order to do that, Again, the more you've built your own resilience, it'll make it even easier to find solutions. And sometimes that's why people talk to people, professionals, like executive right. coaches like myself and others to help them figure it out. Because sometimes it looks like- It feels overwhelming and you just can't yeah. see the forest through the trees. That's absolutely, else can help you to break that down. Fantastic. I'm just curious. I ask a lot of different people this question. How do you define productivity and why? In preparation for our conversation, it did prompt that reflection and- um, And then I was looking at the American Psychological Association's definitions along these lines as well, because I do a lot of my continuing education with them. Uh I do think that some elements of the ratio between output and input, and in the end, how much is it taking you to produce the quantity or the quality of what you want? You know, what is that ratio? And from a psychological perspective, if I look at what I know from a business side and the psychological side, the more we've front loaded and brought the best we can for our brain to function the best it possibly can, then assuming we're in the line of work that we're good at, we're trained in and we enjoy, then we will do pretty good. And quite likely the productivity will be there. Where I see my clients struggle is when this has suffered and then it leads to challenges on the productivity side. And so backfilling here often leads to the results they want. Very good. Everybody's got a different, it's interesting. I've interviewed hundreds of people and everybody has a different definition as to what it really is. So I think that's also one of the things in the workplace that we have to understand and agree on what are some of these terms. You talked about bringing a language, right? A, A vernacular to things. It's understanding how do we define productivity in this context? You also said that, which I think is really important. Contexts change. And so we have to re revisit together and say, you know, what, how do we define productivity today versus yesterday, right? And how do we define resilience and how are we going to make that happen? Good stuff, right? Tell us where people can find out more about you and, and then we'll, we'll bring it to a close. Website, DR like Dr. MH like Marie Helen Peltier, P like Peter, E L E T like Tom, I E R dot com. Otherwise, they'll see my name there on your screen. They'll find me online or on LinkedIn. Always happy to hear from people your thoughts on this conversation. Great conversation. Thank you, Penny. Sure, my pleasure. And so before we close out today, what is the best piece of advice that you got or a personal lesson that really hit home? I have to talk about the lessons I learned. <laughs> Often I bring that to the stage. I think one of the lessons is, it does cite the topic that we've talked about today is the importance of having a plan, of knowing what you're 
action plan is in order, say, in this case, to protect your resilience. Because in the absence of a plan, when you're going to have all these demands, unexpected, larger demands, and, and some chronic, like a pandemic, for example, we're going to lose sight of the plan. And then that's where people deplete or even put themselves at risk. And I did get that personal lesson in a mountaineer yeah. adventure that I share. But that would be the lesson, having your plan. So thank you for being here. Yes. And thank you all for being here. It's important that you take a step back as listeners. You took the time to listen to this program about wellness, about resilience, about in the workplace, and really to walk away from this discussion with that understanding that the best way to be resilient is to have a resilience plan, is to be proactive. And what is one of the things that's most important to you and what's one step and one action that you can take following this that will help you to be on your way to protect your resilience, to build your resilience. So that's your assignment for today. For those who are listening is to identify that one action that's going to make the biggest difference for you when it comes to protecting and building your resilience. So thanks for being here. My name is Penny Zanker, and this is Take Back Time. We'll see you in the next episode. Thank you for listening. Today's topic is another opportunity for you to put the knowledge you learned into practice. Tune in again next week for more strategies that will help you have more energy and focus to get more done in less time so you can continue to take back time.